Welcome to the Huntington Way Show, where we help parents navigate the educational maze. I'm your host, Yvonne Strawn, author and founder of inspirationalhomeschooling.com, and I am speaking with Dr. Douglas Petersma. He is a researcher for the National Home Education Research Institute and professor at Liberty University, or Regent University, excuse me. So this is show is brought to you by Huntington Learning Center and Inspirational Homeschooling. You're listening on Power Talk 1040 AM, 98.5 FM, and 95.7 FM. Welcome to the show, Douglas. Thank you for having me. I appreciate, appreciate the offer to be here. Oh, yeah. I, you have such great information to share. So I'm wondering, um, how did Christian parents come to rely on government for education? Well, this is interesting. If you dig into the the history of education in our country, the history of home education specifically, uh, there's a lot of things that perhaps that we don't really know because we haven't thought about them or sort of dug back into the history on it. But the easiest answer to that question, and I like giving easy answers, by the way, so I'll try to do this. The way we came to rely on the government was very slowly. Mm -hmm. Over time, things changed. Over time, things were proposed. And some of them were accepted. Some of them were not accepted as readily as perhaps those who were uh, proposing them wanted uh, the populace to do, but over time people became really dependent upon the government to provide what was called education, although I have a feeling that, at least in my opinion, it's a lot less education and more schooling, uh, as, as I like to describe it. Um, but, you know, there's a couple of analogies that you can use, and one that I like to use is, uh, we've probably all heard the analogy, if you throw a frog into a pot of hot water, it's going to jump right out because of the difference uh, in the temperature, but if you put it in cold water, it will boil slowly and sort of happily go to its death because it doesn't realize that the changes are there. Uh, just a note, I've never actually tried that. I'm sure most of us probably haven't, uh, but the analogy stands. Uh, and there's a biblical analogy that I like to bring up, too. Uh, the children of Israel went into Egypt, not as a conquered people, but they went there voluntarily. And slowly over time, uh, they were given things, and yet they were also having uh, their freedom taken away. And by the time that they were considered an enslaved uh, people, uh, they had been given certain things by the uh, Egyptian government, and they even came later on to long for those things. In the wilderness, they looked back and they said, mm -hmm. I wish we had the, the melons and the leeks and the garlands, garlic that the Egyptians gave us. Uh, and they had become accustomed to that during their time in slavery. So the architects of what we call public schools now, common schools as they were known uh, initially, uh, they intended to make these changes and they knew they had to make them slow. And they even had to do it kind of deceptively uh, over a period of time because they knew it wouldn't have been accepted by the populace if they had tried to do everything all at one time. So uh, parents have come to depend on the government for this thing, but I think a lot of parents have now realized that there are other options and that there is an opportunity to break away. So a lot of them are doing that. Hmm. Yes, and so that's what we're talking about today, folks. We're talking about why we should be concerned about government involvement in education. So, Douglas, what seems to be the trajectory of implication of government-run schools? Uh, well, I think if you ask pretty much anyone who's involved in education or schooling at all, are we headed in the right direction? I don't know that anybody with a straight face could say, yes, we're heading in the right direction. We're going where we need to go. If you were only to look at the report that is generated annually about the progress of Americans, it's called the uh, National, um, excuse me if I look down at the National Assessment of Educational Progress is sometimes called the nation's report card. It has shown steadily and continuously declines in academic performance, in reading, in math, in science compared to other nations across the world, a steady decrease. So if you just look at it from an academic perspective, you can't say that we're going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. When you look at it from a more holistic perspective, uh, as, I, uh, as I believe I do, really what government education is doing is it's providing a standardized citizenry. It's providing standardized instruction. It wants a standardized outcome in the student population. This is why you have special needs children that are sometimes left behind. This is why you have gifted children, as they are often, uh, oftentimes called, uh, that are not allowed to go to the logical extent of their education uh, because it has to be within uh, the 
standardization that the government has. This has some side effects. It has the side effects of family disestablishment, taking families and, and, and bringing them apart for more time than it ever was before. And you see legislation proposed almost every year. Let's start making mandatory education earlier. Let's extend government education beyond high school to two years of college. And there's this ever increasing effort uh, to control and to have that influence. And we know that influence is not good. We can see that in the academic realm, especially, which of course is the intended purpose. If you ask schools, what are you there to do? We're to, there to teach academics. Are you doing that? Eh, the indications are there's a lot of failures across the system as a whole. Yeah, so what are some of those failures that you can pinpoint? So more so than just the academics, and mm -hmm. again, I, I, I approach this from a Christian worldview perspective. So looking holistically at the development of a child, uh, there are so many things that impact the life of a student, and it's not just the teacher standing in front of the classroom. It includes the curriculum that's being taught. It includes the peer influence of those that they are around, and we know what that peer influence drives. In many cases, it drives bullying. In many cases, it uh, uh, drives violence. In many cases, there are uh, assaults that happen in schools. If we read the news on a daily basis, uh, there are dozens and dozens of incidences across our country. Uh, there are actually social media sites that are totally dedic ex ex exclusively dedicated to finding and putting out to the public. These are the things that are happening in various public schools uh, across our nation, and it's just not good. And of course, we can see that as you ha as these schools have taken out anything that we would consider uh, moral instruction, values instruction, religious instruction, it has simply gone that way. It has gone down the path of a sinful world that we live in. Uh, mm -hmm. And so those are some of the additional things. And many parents are, are looking at schools, and they're not necessarily looking at the academics. Perhaps they think the academics are okay, but they're looking at all these other aspects, and they're saying, we know this is not good, and so we've got to do something else for our children. Yes. And so what is that trajectory with the modern education that you see? So basically, I see modern education is in a has been in a crisis mode ever since the COVID era. Mm -hmm. Parents are realizing that, that this is not ideal for their children, specifically for their children, and they want something different. They're looking for those options. Some of them are looking to different school choice options. Some of them uh, just simply don't know what to do. They just know that their children are not going to continue there uh, in government in government run schools. So I think the government school system is going to face challenges. It's going to face challenges as their numbers go down. That affects their finances. Mm -hmm. They are going to uh, have to adapt. Uh, but a lot of what they're probably going to do is they're probably going to try to uh, oppose what we might consider school choice options or uh, perhaps use legislatures to uh, to try to bring back uh, individuals into the public schooling system, even if it is in a different realm than what it was before. Uh, so I can see it going downhill. I'm not going to say it's going to be a, a quick demise or we're going to see the end of, of government schooling in the next few years, because I don't think that's uh, that's the case. Uh, but changes are, are on the way, and I think uh, those that are home educating are a big part of that because they're affecting it. Oh, yeah. I see that a lot of people are moving into home education and private schools as well, and money talks. Yes. And so when these school districts are getting less and less income, they're like, what do we do? Right? Yeah, it seems like a lot of the COVID emergency funds have run out, and now they're looking for how do they make up for the, the lack of funding that is based on student attendance primarily. So Yeah, that makes sense. So is public school instruction really free from religious instruction? Absolutely not. And like I said, I like short answers when I can give short answers. Uh, government schooling absolutely has a, a religious element to it. And that seems perhaps a little strange, but when we think about it, when the Supreme Court made decisions in the 1960s and said there is no longer going to be prayer allowed or Bible allowed in any kind of context in government schools, that did not make those schools to have no religion. It actually gave them a specific, what I would consider the de facto state religion, which is called secular humanism. And it's underpinned by a scientific presupposition of naturalism, and we would see that in pretty much every science course that's taught in a government school. And it also inherently teaches the theology of atheism. 
And a lot of people would say that, well, atheism isn't a theology. It's the absence of a theology, but it is a way of thinking about God, and it is a way of approaching it. And when you have any kind of instructional basis that completely eliminates God, mm -hmm. you are basically promoting atheism. And for those children who attend that kind of instruction, who perhaps get religious instruction at home or in their faith institutions, it teaches them that, well, even if God exists, he is not relevant to your life and he is not relevant to academics. Uh, so they certainly do have a religious construct. They teach about the fundamentals of life. They teach about questions that are fundamentally religious. Uh, why are we here? What is our purpose? How did, you know, those kinds of things. And so there is an element of uh, religion, even though they would couch it as not being religious yeah. uh, in presenting that to the students. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing all this information about what is going on in schools. When we come back, we are going to talk more about the government in schools. Welcome back to the Huntington Way Show. You're listening on Power Talk 1040 AM, 98.5 FM, and 95.7 FM. Please like and subscribe to Power Talk 1040 on YouTube. I'm your host, Yvonne Strawn, and I'm talking with Dr. Douglas Petersma. We are talking about government involvement in education. Why be concerned? So, Douglas, I'm wondering, um, why should parents be concerned about modern education? Well, I believe the biggest element of education is time. The fact mm -hmm. of the matter is, if a student spends kindergarten through 12th grade in government or in schools, or in any kind of an institutionalized school, you can calculate, depending on the number of hours a school does, somewhere between 10,000 and 17,000 hours, where mm -hmm. they are going to be influenced. And again, teaching isn't just the teacher. It's the curriculum. It's the exposure. It's the peer influence that they have. And that is a huge amount of time. That is time that parents don't have. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to those who are thinking about home education or perhaps have started a home education, what is the greatest benefit? Oftentimes I get asked, and I say it is the time. It is the time that you have with your children. It is the time that you can spend putting into them. Again, I try to approach this from a Christian worldview perspective. If we want to teach our children about the Lord, and if we spend even Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, youth group meetings, over the span of a child's school years, they're going to get somewhere between three and 4,000 hours of instruction in biblical things. And then if you compare that with the 10,000, maybe 15,000 or more hours that they get in non-biblical instruction at a government school, that is a huge difference. And that really factors into data that we're seeing, specifically from organizations like the Barner Group, who are showing that somewhere in the range of 80 to 85 percent of children raised in Christian homes are leaving either their church or their faith entirely by their late teen or early adult years. And I think that should be concerning to parents. It should be concerning to pastors and church ministries and for those who have a faith tradition. So I would say that time is one of the biggest things to be concerned about, the time that others have with our children. Yeah, absolutely. And that gives other people that opportunity to really get in between what we are trying to teach our children. So therefore, diminishing our influence as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know you attend some legislative sessions, and you have faced some of the same challenging phrases that many of us parents face across the country about handing over the responsibility of our kids when they go to schools. Please share that experience and your thoughts around it. Well, whenever I go to legislative sessions and I listen to either legislators or others that are giving testimony speak, I, I always have a keen interest in what they're saying and exactly how they say it. And I have an example. I'm actually going to be reading this example because I heard it both in a press conference by the Wyoming Superintendent of Public Instruction. And then I heard this same uh, phrase and comment repeated at a legislative session. And this is what she said recently. Schools are the one place where parents cede their responsibility of their kids to the government, and typically with no choice in where to send them. Our schools must respect the covenant that relationship implies and not violate the values or contradict the reasonable standards that many parents are trying to instill at home. And when you first hear that, maybe it seems like, okay, that sounds pretty good. This is actually a conservative elected official in our state. But a couple of things really jump out at me. First of all, when the state claims that a parent cedes their responsibility, 
if you ask any parent, when did you cede your responsibility as a parent to the state? Even ones that send their children to a public school, they're going to say, I never did. Mm -hmm. I would say that. I didn't see that. And then there's this implied covenant. They have to keep this implied covenant. If you ask a parent, when did you ever make a covenant with the state that they would, in exchange for instruction, not violate the values you're teaching your children or not contradict your reasonable standards? And they will say, I never made that covenant. I don't even think such a covenant exists. And then, of course, the last thing is when the government says reasonable standards, I have to step back and say, what do you mean by reasonable? Do you get to set the standard of what is reasonable? Because I know at some point, if we have this discussion, at some point the state will say something is reasonable, and I will say that is not reasonable. And so this kind of mentality, it really leads us to understand that the state schooling system acts according to various legal doctrines. And two of them specifically are the legal doctrines of parents patriae and the legal doctrine of in loco parentis. And both of those have to do with the fact that the state can and does assume parental roles and assume certain responsibilities as if they were the parent. Mm -hmm. And so when we ask ourselves, how can school districts act in a certain way? Well, the answer is, is they're acting according to these legal doctrines. Mm -hmm. And I would venture to say that most parents have probably never looked them up. Uh, there was a time when I hadn't looked them up. At some point, I had to learn about these. But I certainly would encourage parents to look into that because that is the default position of the government. At the moment a child is at the door of the school or the moment they step foot on a school bus, they, according to the government, become a proxy parent for that child, and they will act in such ways. And we have seen this in extreme cases in some parts of our country where even they are literally trying to take children away from their parents because the parent doesn't agree with perhaps something that the child has expressed that they want to do. Uh, so that is something that is very concerning. And when I go to these legislations, legislative sessions, I'm listening for that, and I'm trying to bring that up uh, to parents so that they understand the position of the government, which generally doesn't coincide with at least what's in their mind should be the proper place for the government in this, uh, in this uh, system. Yeah, and I think that's so important that parents are aware. So I thank you for sharing that. And parents, I really encourage you to attend a legislative session if you can. Bring your kids if you can. And just go up in the gallery and listen to what is going on there. And just delve into some of those points and have conversations with your kids because this is also relating to what is happening in the future. You know, this will affect generations to come. Gotcha. And they're going to be parents someday as well. Indeed. Yes. So, Douglas, I'm curious, too, what is your thoughts about ESAs and school choice? Because this is something that has been more prominent um, in our country. We haven't seen it yet too much in Colorado, but this is something that legislators are looking at. So this, this is another one. It's a soapbox I could probably get onto for longer than I need to. But I will say this about ESAs, and I would include into that vouchers and perhaps even tax break type programs that are aimed at those who would go to homeschooling or even private schooling. And I will say this. Don't take the cheese. It's mm -hmm. a trap. I oppose this. And this is one that kind of gets me in a little bit of hot water, sometimes with home education groups and sometimes with conservatives, especially conservative legislators who want to do something. They want to show their constituents they're doing something. So they come up with these programs. They've perhaps seen them in other states. Um, but the problem is this, is every one of these programs is based on a concept of forced redistribution of wealth. If I walk up to a conservative legislator and I say, do you believe in the forced redistribution of wealth? They will say no. Mm -hmm. If I ask, how is that different when funds are taken from taxpayers, some taxpayers that may or may not even have kids that are going to school or have kids at school age, and then that is distributed by the government to some going to private school, some going to homeschool, how is that different? And usually there's a very long pause as they try to think of an answer, and the answer is it's not different. One of my favorite homeschool speakers is Israel Wayne, and he specifically said this, you cannot support school choice without first accepting the premise that we should have forced redistribution of wealth. So I oppose it on that premises, but I also oppose it because I worked in government for 20 years, and I understand that government programs are never static. They may start small, but they never stay small. They always grow. And how do they grow? They grow in regulation. They grow in funding requirements. They grow in 
requirements for people to run the programs, employment uh, requirements. And so any one of these programs that starts, and perhaps it's, it's sold to the public as, well, this doesn't have any strings attached, or this is a small program, or this is very simple. We all know that it takes one legislative session to take anything that simple and make it extremely complicated because an amendment in a legislative session gets approved, it gets passed, and next thing you know, you have to deal with turning it around and fighting it. Uh, and so I have opposed everything that's happened like this in my state, and yes, it's even encroaching in mm -hmm. Wyoming where I live. Uh, it's a bill that we're facing even during this current legislative session. Yeah, I see that it's happening really across the nation. Mm -hmm. And I think that legislators they want to support, they want to help, and they see that, okay, you know, if I can support this program, but then it grows because you're going to have legislation parameters, regulations around each of it. So real quickly, what is the best way to preserve parental rights and responsibilities in raising children? Well, I will say this, don't give an inch. And if you see an opportunity to get an inch back, I would get an inch back. Uh, don't let the I can't do it sort of mentality creep in because there is a way and God will make a, allow us to make a way. If we realize that our responsibility originates from God and that's where the mandate is, then we can be confident that God will allow us to make a way to make this happen. But we absolutely can't give any leeway when it comes to parental rights, specifically in the, in the area of education, because if we do that, we give it away, they're going to take more than we expected them to take. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Douglas, thank you for joining me. Just share real quickly how people can find you. Well, you can find me on various social media, specifically on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, and Twitter. It's at Dr. Douglas Petersma, except on Twitter where it had to be shorter, so it's at Dr. Doug Petersma. Uh, and uh, you can find me there and follow me, and I try to put out as much encouragement as I can for the home education community. Thank you so much, Douglas. I express our gratitude to our sponsors, Inspirational Homeschooling and the Huntington Learning Center for bringing this show to you. This is Yvonne Strawn, today's host on the Huntington Way Show. Thank you for joining us.